Hello, welcome to this uh, virtual version of uh, PS Conf U 2020. Uh, my name is Grazia Laiazzi and uh, today I'm gonna uh, walk you through how you shouldn't be scared uh, of calling APIs. Uh, of course, this wouldn't have been possible without our amazing uh, sponsor. So thank you so much uh, for helping us. Uh, let's start with the, with the agenda. So uh, I will uh, talk about what an API is, uh, some of the standards and implementation you can find, uh, what are the entities involved, uh, what commonlets PowerShell give us uh, to be able to interact with API, uh, APIs, the difference uh, between invoke REST method and invoke uh, web request, uh, when to use one or the other. Uh, the different kind of uh, authentication and pagination and examples of them uh, from different applications. And uh, a couple of examples of uh, how to get and send data and uh, why you will do it and uh, what you can use uh, this data for. Also, the API uh, I will talk about uh, are provided by third-part companies involving uh, applications you may have heard about, uh, like Jira, Slack, Trello. So, how you can use them and um, how, um, like, how you can use them in a daily uh, basis um, for your work, and. Um, I will not talk about how APIs are developed themselves or how to do it with how to develop APIs in PowerShell. It's uh, purely how uh, we can use them and uh, uh, what are the, the best way I found out uh, that are good for me. And then we will have a summary uh, with some takeaways. Uh, let's move to... What is an API? So for a few years, I've been using APIs now and uh, um, I never looked into the theory of it, uh, nor I learned a proper definition of words around it. So when I started preparing this presentation, uh, I went online looking for enlightenment and I went down to a rabbit hole. This topic is so broad and um, there is so much information about it, so I decided to focus on uh, the kind of APIs we will talk about today, which are the ones used in web applications. Um, so the acronym uh, API stands for uh, Application Programming Interface, and the definition I found more appropriate for today it is a set of endpoints that allows you to interact with a specific uh, web application. Uh, where endpoints are a set of dedicated URLs. So they are web-based and accessible through HTTP and HTTPS uh, that, uh, when they are used, uh, run a set of functions server-side and return the response in a standard way, which uh, mostly is uh, through JSON and uh, XML. Image you want to download uh, from Twitter, all the tweets related to uh, PS Confio, uh, with the comments, dates, um, replies, and all the memes, etc. You cannot do it from the web or the mobile version of Twitter. So what do you do? Do you give up? Uh, do you start screenshot uh, everything? Maybe not, it's not the right approach. So you can write a little bit of uh, code and uh, use the Twitter API to retrieve the data you need. Um, for some people like me, where part uh, of my job is to take care of user provisioning, automating the way users are granted uh, permissions, um, integrate one uh, or more application together, or copy movie data from one application to another, compare long list of users uh, coming from different applications, uh, or other things. Um, Using APIs is essential. Um, this because I have to be able to automate part of those processes, otherwise I will spend my day um, looking at spreadsheets. It can be a time of one one off thing. Uh, I need this thing and this one request they will never ask anymore. Uh, but uh, you can just use the API to collect this data quickly in five minutes. Uh, or it can be a recurring task that uh, you need to schedule and uh, 
you just prepare it once and you let it run and it works, which is the essence of uh, automating. Um, okay, what are the different standards that we can find? If you work with APIs, uh, you have heard some of those uh, terms. Uh, they basically identify how you are um, expecting the API to be developed, what standard do they follow, and um, uh, what they are used for. Uh, if you have worked with um, the same type uh, already uh, in the past, uh, you may expect a similar uh, implementation and a similar data return um, in the same format, basically. Um, so the first thing we will talk about is REST. What REST means? So the uh, REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it is the architectural style uh, that defines the properties and the constraints about how API can be developed. Some of those properties are uh, performance, uh, like uh, where are the data stored, how to retrieve it, scalability, portability, visibility, uh, which uh, basically gives uh, rules how they should be developed. Um, one of the most important constraints uh, is a uniform interface, which implies that the architecture uh, enables uh, independence for each different endpoint, so they can evolve separately. But you can also have a definition of client-server architecture, stateliness, uh, cacheability, all those properties uh, uh, helps uh, help to have um, a standard among all the APIs uh, on how they uh, are developed. Um, there is a, uh, you may also have heard RESTful. So REST is the standard uh, on how a, um, an API should be developed. RESTful is a service, so a web server service, an API uh, that is implemented uh, following those rules. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about is scheme. Uh, that stands for a system for cross-domain identity management. Uh, it was designed to uh, easily manage user identities like uh, users and groups uh, in application um, in cloud-based application like SaaS uh, service um, software as a service or other services. It basically, it implements the identity management defined in the REST definition, providing a common scheme and a, a protocol, where uh, um, the scheme protocol is uh, just an uh, application level, HTTP-based, for uh, provisioning and managing identity uh, data more efficiently. Uh, Graph API uh, models the data uh, in terms of nodes and edges, where the edge rep re edges uh, represent the relationship between the nodes. Um, that's why the word graph, like in the graph theory in math, uh, the most interesting feature the Graph API has uh, is the possibility to interact with uh, different resources located in different nodes. Uh, with a single request. And the most uh, common example of a company using a Graph API is Facebook. Uh, with one call, you may be able to get a post, author, uh, the author profile, and all the comments. Uh, where else, uh, with the REST API, uh, pure REST API, you will need uh, to call multiple endpoints to get all the data you need. Uh, Open API. I'm not gonna show to you any um, example of this, but uh, it's becoming more and more uh, um, popular. So I just wanted to mention what it is and what it does. And basically it defines another standard. Uh, it's a programming language agnostic interface uh, description for REST APIs. This allows to discover and understand the capability of a service without requesting access to the source code or you don't need additional documentation uh, 
removing most of the guesswork in calling a service. It can be used in uh, documentation generation tools to display the API uh, documentation and definition. Uh, you can write it in YAML or JSON, which is very nice. Um, you can also use in uh, generate. Uh, Gener generation tools or uh, testing tools is very versatile and uh, definitely it's worth looking into it. Oops, okay, so what to know before calling an API? Uh, well, for sure you already know what the application involved is that you need to interact with so starting from that they have documentation about the api so you can go and look for it and see if they um how it, it works uh, i don't have the audience uh, i cannot ask but in my experience uh is that every time i have to use a, a new api i have a lot of problems starting out sometimes it's a documentation that is very basic sometimes it's because i think something works in a certain way that will give you a certain data or will do an, a certain action but it doesn't um so i it takes time and you can find that uh, even if you are using an enterprise application you can find problems and missing features that uh, can stop you so the first thing to understand up front is the authentication. We will talk about this a little bit more later, but uh, there can be different ways on uh, how you can authenticate in an API. So it's important to understand exactly how it works because you may need help from other people to get some piece of the information uh, to keep uh, going. Methods are basically, um, when you run your request, the method you use basically tells uh, the endpoint uh, what action you want to do. Uh, they are mostly self-explanatory. Uh, get is used to get to retrieve data. Post is used to create a new record uh, like new users or upload a, a file, a configuration file or something. Put and patch uh, depending on how the endpoint is developed, uh, they can help you modify data uh, like user profile or permissions, etc. Uh, not all of them are always available. Uh, there are way more than the ones I listed and uh, I'm not going to explain all, uh, all of those. Uh, you can go and find them online. Uh, but there are two things I want to point out. Uh, even if uh, they have similar names, put put patch uh, they can in in an english way over a lap in the meaning sometimes uh, they are not the same you need to know exactly which one to use because the the endpoint will expect one or the other and if it gets the one that is not correct it doesn't work um I once had uh, this person asking me, uh, oh, I'm trying to use the API, it's not working, what's going on? So I looked around uh, to the call he was making, everything looks okay, the data I was sending. Uh, and then I looked at the documentation and basically he was using a post instead of put and of course he was getting an error and he was like, don't they uh, are all the same? They, they don't do the same. I was like, no, you need really need to learn to read the documentation. Uh, the second thing I wanted to, to say is that you can call uh, uh, the same endpoint uh, using different methods uh, to and have different uh, and do different actions. So if you are calling an endpoint of a user and with a get, you may want to retrieve the information of the, the user and it's the same exact URL with the user ID or something. Uh, but if you use it with um, with a put, uh, you may want to change one of the profiles. So maybe you have to um, embed uh, some of the information using the other or uh, or the body or in query string. Uh, the other piece of information is the other, and uh, it lets the client and the server uh, pass additional information with uh, it with the HTTP or HTTP request and, resp uh, and response. So provides the metadata attached to the request uh, or to the response, uh, other useful information like uh, what content type, 
uh, is there and the status of the response, the authentication information, proxy information that sometimes uh, you, you may need to have. The last thing is the body. So from a request point of view, uh, it is mostly used when we want to send data through the endpoint. Uh, like uh, with the put or the post method, uh, you can create update users. Uh, as we said before, um, with the body, you can send out the data and uh, most of the time it's done with a JSON format. Um, in the get is not always used, sometimes it's used. Uh, we will see an example uh, later. From a response point of view, uh, the body is the actual data you get back from the endpoint. Um, an advice, how do you start? Uh, start from the documentation, even if sometimes it's not enough uh, and you are left with doubts. You can start simple, try to get uh, some result, to get confident with the data, understand how they are uh, formatted, or look online for examples um, from other people. Most of the time they are in Python, but at least you can get an idea of how the format uh, of the data have to be sent or will be received. Uh, finally, some PowerShell. Um, what commandlets are there in PowerShell um, that allows us to interact with APIs? There are two of them. Um, I will explain what they are and what is the difference and also why we should use invoke REST method. Uh, based on the Microsoft uh, documentation, invoke web request, um, get content from a web page on the internet and uh, invoke REST method sends uh, an HTTP or HTTP request to a RESTful web service. Both of them actually can send an HTTP or an HTTP request. TTPS request uh, to a web page or a web service to get link, a list of users, images, files, uh, or they can send data to set up users' permission, fill in a form, etc. If you look at their definition in the Microsoft documentation, most of the parameters that you can use are the same. Uh, you can pass credential to login, web sessions, uh, you can use different methods like get, post, put or uh, you can set up the proxy or you can force no proxy because you do, you need to escape that so where are they different as i said uh, the boat can send the request out and when the request is processed they parse the result uh, the com uh, they parse the result uh, before to pre present it to you and the main difference is basically how they pass the result uh, before sending it back, uh, how they guess what kind of um, format they have. So invoke uh, web request, parse the response in an HTML format. And um, so if you need to get the content of an HTML page, you will definitely use invoke a web request. And the output uh, will be basically a basic HTML web response object, which is uh, the only object supported uh, from PowerShell 6. Instead, invoke REST method parse the response in JSON or uh, XML. Normally for APIs, you will use uh, invoke REST method as if they are developed in a um, RESTful way, uh, they have to follow all the standards and the data you get back from a response have uh, an accepted format of uh, JSON or uh, XML. And the output will be like a string or an XML document based on the format or uh, the content retrieved. And additionally, um, if you assign your call to a, uh, to a variable in PowerShell, that variable will be already a PS object. So you don't need to transform it uh, from uh, a JSON. Um, the other thing uh, is that in case you use uh, invoke web request uh, for the same, uh, for the same call you will use a uh, REST method, uh, invoke REST method, uh, you will have to catch the content of the response yourself and then convert it to JSON uh, before you can use the data. OK, 
Okay, so I prepared a few use cases to show uh, to you um, the different kinds of uh, authentications and uh, pagination I have encountered um, so far. Um, an example on how to get data out from workplace and uh, how this data can be used, why, what is the use case in there. Uh, a small example of a nightmare trying to deprovision users in Trello and uh, how to grant a specific additional uh, permission in, uh, in BlueJeans. So let's start with the authentication. Uh, we have two types of authentications. So one is a, a basic authentication, which is purely the use of a username and password. Uh, they have to be linked together in a pair and uh, encoded in uh, base64 before being able to use them. And then we have a better token uh, that basically um, based on the, uh, the definition in the RFC is uh, uh, an opaque string not intended to have any meaning to the client using it. Um, they are basically strings that uh, uniquely identify an entity that is requesting access to an application. TLS is mandatory most of the time based on the implementation, which means it's more secure uh, to transmit this information. Of course, you still have to save your tokens in a password manager and not write them in plain text uh, in the script, even though I know some of us still do that sometimes. Sorry, JD, <laughs> we shouldn't do that. Uh, another plus is that uh, if they are generated programmatically uh, with an API call, uh, they are sent as a response in JSON, uh, which is very useful uh, and easy to, to get then the token back. Also, depending on how the API is developed, the token uh, can be sent in the request uh, with, uh, in the header or in the body as a parameter or uh, um, in query string to the URI. Okay, let's show you some code. So the first example of uh, uh, authentication I wanna show you is basic authentication. And this example comes from Jira. These uh, versions of Jira Server and Data Center, they are basically the ones you would um, um, you would install uh, in your infrastructure. They are not cloud-based, um, like they are not SaaS-based. Um, um, and uh, this version of Jira uh, only um, use basic authentication. What does that mean? Is that we have to provide a username and a password. Uh, of course, um, you need to re retrieve it from uh, somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, in this example, I just used uh, the get secret, which is available in PowerShell 7, um, which is super useful. Uh, then, as we said, uh, we need to tie them together in a single string uh, as a pair uh, divided by a, col a column so that uh, it can be encoded in base64. So I'm not going to explain uh, what this does, but basically we just get the bytes out uh, of, uh, of the variable of the string and then uh, this other function just uh, encode it in uh, base64. The thing you have to know is that uh, oh, this example is one of those where uh, the authentication is sent uh, in the request through the other and when this happens um, you need to have uh, you need to have you have to set up your uh, header as an hash table uh, with um, the key called authorization and the variable that you pass to it, it has to have a prefix uh, called basic. Uh, and yeah, you need to basically concatenate together uh, basic and the token you just get. You cannot just pass the token, otherwise um, the API wouldn't know what to do with that. Uh, that's done. So you prepared your header and uh, uh, this is how the piece of basic authentication works. Uh, I put on some tests here so uh, when the code will be available 
uh, you can just download it and uh, this example will help you to um, retrieve data from a ticket from Jira. Uh, the second authentication I want to show to you is uh, uh, from Slack and this is an example of still sending the um, authentication through the other but with a better token and this token uh, is generated uh, from the application so there is a, you log in into Slack and there is a, a specific URL you can go and uh, you can get a token that is tied uh, to your uh, um, to your account and uh, uh, you can retrieve this string even that uh, it's generated like that you need to save it somewhere it's not something uh, you can uh, programmatically uh, generate uh, that's why uh, you save it somewhere in your whatever vault or a person manager you use and you retrieve it from there and uh, um, as opposite as the basic authentication the prefix of the string it has to be better and it works exactly in the same way as you can see, it's way easier. Uh, in this case, there is way less code. You don't need to work with strings or, uh, uh, you know, encode them uh, somehow. Same thing here. I'm not going to uh, show to you the example, but uh, uh, if your authentication works, you can call this and get the total amount of uh, users of your Slack instance. Uh, the third one is Trello. So Trello is a little bit different. Uh, um, uh, it pass the token in query string is one of those examples, and uh, uh, it also is generated through links um, in the application itself. So the first thing it is you have to log in into Trello. Uh, actually, this also works with your uh, um, personal account if you have one. Uh, you go uh, straight to this uh, URL and it gives you an application key. This is an example of those where the token itself uh, uh, is not enough. You need to tie it to another key. Um, and from this page, so this link here is to get the token if you are using an enterprise version of Trello. But uh, um, if you are using your own, from this page you will have a link to generate uh, your uh, personal token. And you can do the same, given that you um, have generated those through the interface, you can save them safely somewhere. And uh, basically you are done. Uh, the only thing you have to do it is to put them in query string uh, in the URI, which means basically uh, set up the string in this way. You may have more parameters uh, to pass to the URI based on uh, uh, what application uh, you are working, how the, sorry, how the endpoint work. Uh, in this case, uh, the endpoint is just a get uh, to get all your boards, uh, the boards you have access to. And uh, this is the same. If your authentication and your token is good and uh, um, you will be able to list all of them from here. The last one is one of the uh, a little bit uh, trickier, uh, if you want to say like that, uh, but it's an example of uh, um, still sending the token in query string, but in order to, uh, to, you can generate the token programmatically, which is very nice when you are trying to, uh, sorry, <laughs> get. Um, which is very good when you are trying to um, to automate as much as possible. But still, um, in this way, um, we need to get two pieces of information, which are the client ID and the client secret, which sometimes you can get them from the, the interface of your application or the vendor can uh, provide it to you so you will be able to use them and uh, once you have those the first thing you have to do you have to call two endpoints the first one is to uh, retrieve the token and the second one is the one you have to do your action for so the way that blue jeans um, uh, wants you to call the token uh, well to re 
the way it wants you to format the data to retrieve the token is uh, first of all you need an header uh, where uh, you say what content type you are sending because we need a body so we need to tell the endpoint what type of data we are sending out and what type of data they have to accept uh, also this is a post even if we are getting a data this is still a post because at this point this endpoint generates a new token and it is save it somewhere so it's not that it's retrieving a data uh, a value that is already there but is also generating it and give you a response that hey we generated it is fine so this that's why it can be a little bit misleading it's not giving you uh, just the token it's also generating it's doing other work so that's why the post method here uh, they have a specific uh, endpoint for this, uh, which is uh, OAuth2, uh, that generates the token. The body uh, has to be in a specific format, uh, which is, uh, you need to uh, tell it what kind of token it is, so it clients, then it's, it's a credential, basically. Uh, and then you have to pass the two pieces of information we got before, the client ID and the client secret. Now, um, in PowerShell, uh, you can use the body um, when you have to do these things. Uh, if it's just one uh, row, like here, you can use uh, uh, ear strings, and it's uh, pretty easy to uh, to do that. You can also um, defined an hash table and then convert it to json so the format is the same depending on how many how much information you need to uh, to pass uh, both works and what do we do here is basically um, you just call the endpoint once and as i said given that it returns a JSON file, an object, basically. Uh, I can, without assigning it to another variable and then uh, take the value inside the object, I can just put it into parentheses and then call the value of uh, the variable among the ones I received back that I need, and I can just assign it to the token. So if everything works as expected, then you can use the test. And here I'm just trying to get um, the, uh, the user profile of, uh, of a specific user, basically. Um, OK. Let's go back to the slides. OK, so next thing, pagination. You may have um, already you may be already you know familiar with uh, with the concept uh, but basically uh, is the is the concept of dividing the results uh, into different pages why do we need this uh, can we just take all the results uh, all at once when it bother it doesn't really work like that in the real world um, pagination helps performance while retrieving data so API calls can potentially return millions of results or even more. Uh, from a server-side point of view, uh, it can hit those servers very hard, especially if everyone in the world is doing exactly the same thing. So image you go to Amazon looking for a new laptop, and when you open the home page, it returns uh, every item they have in the catalog. Uh, that will, wouldn't scale. Uh, the page may time out or... Uh, it will take ages to load. In the same way, endpoints um, that provide a list of entities, most likely they will use some sort of pagination. Uh, also, companies that develop uh, APIs have limits on how many calls you can run. Uh, it can be per second or uh, for a range of time. All of this to ensure good performance and also for security reasons. Um, so what type of pagination do we have? Uh, yeah, we can have known like um, in some cases um, when the company is still very small, they just opened, uh, it's better to provide some APIs um, than, and then think about pagination later. You can put it in the next sprint, uh, probably, if you have 10 clients. Um, 
or uh, the limit is so high that um, and your use case your own use case is so small that uh, uh, you can ignore any limit and uh, you can list all your items together um, like the list of all the employees of your company using the application is uh, uh, so little that uh, it doesn't affect uh, the performance uh, of the request so you don't need to bother then we have offset seek and key set i grouped them all in the same point because they are all based on sql server syntax in a slightly different way so if you have a little bit of experience with SQL, basically uh, they use limits offset uh, um, and sorting of some kind to count how many results you can get, what page you run in, and what is the next or the previous set of data to give to you. So when you use them, uh, you need to calculate calculate or uh, to define the amount of records returned and uh, increase counters uh, to read the next page. They seem a lot of work uh, to use uh, but they are uh, the simplest to implement that's why they are uh, so popular. So let me show you an example of this. Uh, counter slug. So uh, what happened with Slack? Uh, Slack used this method uh, to paginate, um, which is fine, but up until last year, their limit was so high. Uh, when you were calling the API, you could just put a count that was huge. Uh, well, this is just an example, I didn't have this. Uh, but they wouldn't, um, they, they wouldn't care. So, um, and you, you could have get you know, 2,000, 3,000 users all together at the same time. And as you see, it's so, you, uh, so easy to use like that. What happened is that uh, they probably grow too much and um, to maintain performance, they had to put a limit where the maximum amount of items you could get in a call, it's 1,000. So... What uh, what did I have to do to change from that code to this one? Uh, and here I'm talking about a scheme um, kind of APIs, which means is the one uh, they have developed uh, to to give it to enterprise companies that uh, to maintain their users. Uh, what do we have to do? The first thing is that uh, I needed to understand how the call changed, uh, so. Sorry, the example before, if you were calling this, we will get in the total results of the users uh, and uh, how many items per page we were getting, right? And it was exactly the same number. Now, I need to calculate, based on this total result, how many pages I can run. I cannot let it run forever. I need to know exactly how many pages of users I have. So, I need to do two calls. The first one is to retrieve the total result of people. So, is it, this, it is exactly the same endpoint because it gives you this, uh, this information uh, plus uh, the user information. Uh, so that's why I put the URI as a parameter because then I can use in both, uh, the, in both the calls. So the first time I call it, I get this user object, uh, which is exactly the same as before, but now with the new API, it's changed. Uh, I do have a start index now which is the counter that I need to increase in order to be able to go from one page to another. Uh, so the first thing I do, I call it once, I get this total amount of people and uh, I put it in this variable. And what I do it is I divide it by a thousand, which are the maximum amount of uh, items I can get. I can also do 500 if I want to, or 10, uh, but then we have to call it, you know, I don't know, countless hundreds of times uh, to get all the users. So you want to get the maximum amount of result uh, with one call. And uh, what I do, I use the floor um, method to get always the um, clo the closest, bot closest bottom uh, integer. That's because I like to run my four starting from zero and not from one. So 
in this case uh, I get three but given that uh, I run it from zero then I can go from zero to three and I get four pages right uh, given that I define my four and what I do is that every time it's cycle I call uh, the same endpoint but I add uh, I need to escape the question mark here otherwise it wouldn't work I need to still pass the count uh, otherwise I think the, uh, the default is 10 and then I need to uh, define this index or every time so the first time index is 1 because I want to start from the first item um, of course I pass my header as well uh, which we didn't define yet but uh, is not important uh, and then the all the result I get I just put it in another object so basically every time I call it I get a, one of one of these um, where uh, as you can see the resource is basically the data I really wanna uh, wanna get which are the users so uh, there will be a list of uh, objects done in this way with all the information like uh, names title display name I don't know username all of those for each user and the last thing I do in the loop it is to increase it of a thousand why because I already started from one I got a thousand and then I have to start from a thousand one which is the first uh, item in the second page and every time I do it, uh, this increase of uh, a thousand, which is the, sec the, the next time is going to be 2001, uh, 3001. Every time I, I you know, use the, the page to, I, I, I use it to turn the page. And at the end, basically, I will just have uh, this object and then I can explode uh, reading the resources and go deep uh, to collect all my data. Of course, you need to uh, iterate again the object. It's not that the object you got um, only as the data you really need. You need to work with it uh, a little bit to retrieve exactly uh, what variables uh, you want to get out of it. Uh, and this is how it works. It will run, uh, in this case, uh, four times and uh, uh, of course every time it runs in, from the first in between uh, the item per pages and the total result is always gonna be the same so well the total result doesn't change uh, and um, we get a thousand at a time the start uh, index of course will change in every call uh, in the last call what happens is that uh, if every time we take a thousand in the last uh, call, we only get the remaining 450. So the items uh, per page will be 450. Uh, and the starting index is going to be uh, the related one on the page you are in, basically. And this is how uh, this works. Uh, let's go back here and uh, uh, the last example is oh, not the last. Uh, the next example is a cursor or a relay cursor. Cursor. Um, this is used uh, in the graph uh, APIs and uh, um, as per Facebook documentation, uh, it is the most efficient method of paginating and uh, should always be used while uh, when possible. A cursor refers to a random string of characters uh, which is tied to a specific item in a list of data. So this object uh, has uh, um, parameters uh, like links to the previews or the next page. So you don't need to build or carry the first URI. Uh, um, you defined you need to, you don't need to build the uri all the time it does it for you uh, you can just use that um, and um, is uh, way easier to loop uh, using those links basically and the biggest uh, pro is that it handles real-time data efficiently 
Um, also, this piece of information is held uh, into the body uh, when, uh, when we get the response. And based on that, when you call the endpoint, uh, um, you have to retrieve this data and uh, in a certain way uh, that then uh, you can use it uh, afterwards to go and you know go through all the pages. But uh, um, I'm gonna show to you an example right now which is uh, uh, from uh, Workplace. So I'm not sure everyone knows what Workplace is. It's basically Facebook for business. Uh, it's uh, a community where uh, people can post things. You have different groups um, where people can talk about topics and post things and comment on things, just like a regular Facebook, but for your company. Um, they share uh, the same concept of API. So if you have worked with the Facebook API, this works um, in the same way. There are only uh, different, sometimes the features can be a little bit different because of the enterprise, um, the enterprise use. Uh, in this case, I didn't show you before, but uh, uh, Workplace as uh, authentication also use uh, uh, you can generate a token from the interface and all but not yourself you need to contact an administrator of Workplace to do it for you uh, they can generate a token and assign exactly what permission you need based on the usage you want to do so if you want to do uh, develop your own bot or automate some stuff or integrate uh, Workplace with some something else uh, based on the what permission you need uh, we can set up the token and uh, give it to you. Basically, it's uh, untied to your uh, personal account. Uh, so when you get the string, you put it somewhere uh, as we saw before. Uh, here, uh, this gets basically the members of the community. Um, and uh, what happens uh, here is that uh, um, when you run this, the you, you need to run this twice, like we did for um, the counter, but not to get um, the amount of pages because you don't know how many pages you're gonna do, but uh, to retrieve the paging tag, which is this one. So when you call it the first time and the member object, if you print it, you will have two tags. One is the data, which uh, has the members of the community, so information about them and uh, uh, paging, which basically gives you those links I was talking about. Uh, like in this case, you have the next link and uh, it contains everything. So the first one, you have to set up the, the token or sometimes you need to, uh, you can choose fields you want to retrieve. We will see an example about this later. In this case, uh, everything is attached automatically from this one and uh, it generates these strings. So what do you need to do? Given that this is already an object, you can just call members object uh, dot paging dot next and it will just navigate straight to the URL uh, that you can run. And uh, you can loop into this because the last one will have it empty and it means the while will just exit. And what you have to do, you don't have to do anything else. You just call uh, the rest, uh, invoke rest method with the URI, because even the, well, the method is, uh, is get, so it's default there, but um, you just pass the same variable and it will just work out of the blue. What I do here is also uh, for each call, I get, um, I save the data. So I do have all the users then in this object to explode uh, later. Okay, the next examples is uh, relation links. Uh, those are um, similar to the links we just saw. Uh, but uh, they are held in the response header. Um, they, are, they are used to, uh, basically, their correlation because they are used to indicate the relations uh, between a, a service of um, a sequence of pages, uh, like the previous and the next link uh, we just saw before. But this time the relationship is held um, in a little bit different format than that. 
uh, I can uh, I will show to you an example um, the relation link have uh, um, they don't uh, what yeah this is super important so uh, from PowerShell 6, uh, the relation link have their own dedicated parameter in uh, invokeless method that makes it so easy to um, to use. Uh, we will see an example, and uh, this basically allows you to uh, do just one call and retrieve all the pages all together. It um, it will be just one invoke REST method and uh, the loop inside it uh, is just going to be transparent to you. Isn't it awesome? Um, let me show to you uh, this example. This is from GitLab, GitHub. Um, as I said, um, this information is held in the, in the header and I'm going to show you uh, how uh, it is represented, but basically um, let's say you want to retrieve, uh, GitHub is a good example because not everyone has uh, this sort of implementation, uh, but they do. So let's say we want to get uh, all the issues from the PowerShell repository. I got this from uh, actually from one of the issues uh, in the GitHub, uh, but it was a very good example. Let's say uh, we want to get the issues, but only the first four pages. Um, so what do we do? Uh, let's run it. Okay, so what do you expect from these? Uh, all the data from all the four pages? Uh, nope. Um, if you count the results, you will not get the real data, but you will get four. Four is the number of the pages. Basically, uh, this object um, for each call will contain exactly the the JSON uh, that you get every time from every page in the in the same format. It doesn't merge them together uh, in just having a big data bulk uh, object. You need to do it yourself. So, for example, if you count uh, the first page, you get uh, yeah 30 uh, 30 pages. Uh, let's say. Uh, four is the maximum of the pages of issues. You will get uh, maybe 30 because it's square. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, yeah, you're going to get 10, 15 or something. And uh, if you go deep on them, uh, you are going to see the exact issue. So this is to show to you that uh, even if it's super easy to use, then you still need to then explode this object to retrieve oops sorry uh, to retrieve the object uh, that you need uh, so oops let me do it again <laughs> um, F8 okay so as you see what we got uh, it's um, already a formatted object uh, of uh, everything related to the ticket, uh, the number, uh, the title, uh, the users that worked on it, uh, the, the description, whatever it is related to, okay? And this is all done transparently. You don't have to care about the implementation, but I want to look how it uh, I wanted to see how it looks like in the header itself and we do have this other parameter which is super nice called response headers variable uh, which basically uh, you can just pass it a string it can be anything uh, as you can see ABC and uh, once um, the the call uh, the command that has finished to run uh, this is um, a variable that you can actually use and uh, explore to see what uh, what it gives to you so this is exactly the same call as before and uh, let's give it a second and if we open it now now we can run this this variable will be available this is the all adder uh, we got in the response so as you can see, uh, we have the date, uh, when we run it, the server, which is uh, 
GitHub, of course, the status of the call, which is also a nice information. This is what I was talking about when you have an adder and you may need to troubleshoot something or to get uh, more information out of it. You can do it through, uh, through this. And what I want to point out is this link. Um, I'm going to explode this a little bit so we can see what it contains. And basically, as you can see, those are pairs of uh, information concatenated. So we are at this point at page four because we decided for that. So the first relation, this is YREL, um, we get is the previous page, which is page equals stream. And uh, you can uh, also use this to go to navigate to the previous version, basically. Uh, the next one, the relationship is next, and this is the next page because it's page five. You also have uh, the last page, so there are 85 pages of issues uh, in the PowerShell uh, repository in GitHub, uh, or uh, you have also the link to the first page, and this is very useful um, to, very useful to, you know, very easy to use. Uh, not everyone uses this standard, so you cannot always find um, uh, this link. Um, but yeah, whenever you, you have the chance, uh, this is super easy to use. So you can um, uh, you can try it out yourself. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Oh, the use cases. So this is the first one of the use cases I want to show to you. Uh, this case um, came in one day because um, it's not possible in workplace for whoever is managing groups uh, with a group admin. Uh, it's not possible to export members of the group. The use case here is uh, um, sometimes uh, there are different groups with the same topic, they want to merge them together, so they just want to uh, export the, the, the users list and import them back, uh, or uh, um, they want to analyze uh, who is joining uh, those groups, or uh, they just want to contact them by email. They don't want to post something in workplace, maybe they want to send an invitation through the calendar. There can be uh, several use cases. Um, at the time when I was asked, it was not possible at all. Now it is possible from the interface uh, for uh, workplace administrators, but still one of like export button. I cannot uh, really uh, um, schedule an export if I, um, that is the use case, right? So um, what was the request? Yeah, very simple. Can you give me the list of the members uh, of this group? Um, I said, yeah, sure, I didn't really do it before, uh, I didn't know if the API, um, you, if you could do it through the API, but then the week later, someone else, same question, but can I get only the ones that joined uh, uh, last week, or uh, after that, can you also add the department, uh, I need to do some statistic out of it, and uh, uh, someone else out of the blue just said, oh, can I uh, get this data and uh, can you send this by email uh, to me like on a weekly base, uh, basis? Um, so what do I do? Uh, I didn't know if the endpoint was there on the, fir the first time. Not um, every time... Um, something is missing from the interface, not always it's available in the API. Most of the time it is, but sometimes it's not. So it may be um, problematic to retrieve it. Uh, there is a date involved. I never dealt with dates. Uh, this was uh, uh, some time ago when I was not very familiar with it. Uh, how do I do this with PowerShell? How do I send an email with an attachment? I, how do I do all those things in PowerShell? So I, uh, instead of screaming, I just went online trying to break down the, the problem in different pieces, um, trying to understand how to do this in a, in a nice way, right? So let me show to you how, 
uh, this works. So let's go here. I'm gonna put this like this. Okay, so the first thing, as I said, I split the problem in uh, different, in, um, you know, smaller pieces. The first thing, I needed to get data uh, out of workplace. And uh, uh, what do we need? So the end point at that point is a graph ID, is a graph API. And uh, as I said, it's very nice. So uh, this is a very nice example. We are eating a group uh, endpoint. And uh, we are calling the um, function to call to to get the, the members. But uh, what normally you will get is just a list of the people, uh, not with their details. But uh, in this case, given that is a graph uh, API, you can also call certain fields because the members are linked to the users in the community, uh, and that object else the members um, uh, attributes and then you can retrieve them as well so in one call you can get more information than the ones you would uh, without a graph API so in this case uh, I needed the first name the last name the email the join date and the department which is a, a variable of um, of the members, not the group itself. Um, we already saw that the PI token gets uh, in query string. So how we, we already saw this code before. This is the pagination. Uh, what in, is different is just that the endpoints, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mention is uh, I need the group ID. I need to know exactly which group I have to get the member out of. So uh, I do define a variable with uh, an ID that defines which group it is and what members to get. And also the method is get uh, because we need to get data. And this is exactly what I did before that I already showed to you. I call it once, I collect the data I get for the first page, and then I just loop into the next page up until it finished. So I do have this member list uh, object that helps every, um, every user. Uh, as you can see, if uh, I cannot run it, so I just showed it to you here. And uh, oops, this is Greg Cubs. Um, and this is sorry, my OCD. Uh, so if you explode member list, so the description, the department is not here. Uh, I took uh, the wrong example, uh, but let's say you will have also the department in this list. And uh, this is how it is. Basically, a list of each one of the object is uh, one of the members of this specific group. What you can see from here is the join date is not a really date that I can just you know ship in a CSV and uh, send it to people. The John in marketing, uh, he wouldn't understand what this is. So I have to uh, convert it to a readable uh, format. And at that point, I never did that with PowerShell. I didn't know. So I just went to online looking for clues and um, this is what I came up with. It looks bad, it's not that bad. Uh, the thing that I do every time is uh, um, when I have an object and I have to loop into it to do something, to send a request, or um, even if I don't have to change the data but just use the data inside, I create a new object uh, just to keep them separated and then uh, Maybe I can print this in a CSV or do reporting on this one after I use the data. Uh, someone once told me that uh, using a object uh, is free, so you can create as many as you want. I'm not sure it's true, but I'm going to trust him. Um, so easily, it's like two lines of code. Um, how you do is you define uh, a new object of a type date time and uh, uh, with the, the argument list is uh, what date you want this variable to have and given that it is an epoch uh, we just uh, assign this date uh, the origin of the uh, every epoch um, a date which is the 1st of January 1970 blah 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 and what we do is just uh, um, 
we call this variable and given that it is a date we have this method um, available uh, which adds seconds so I oh I changed my my code uh, but basically it should be element um, it should be like this dot joined so this is yeah, programmatically it works like that it reads uh, every uh, joint date from um, this list I just passed and adds as many seconds to the default date so the initial date so here the joint variables uh, variable um, will be already a readable uh, format of date uh, this is the beauty also of this method that uh, um, apart from just counting and adding the seconds it's also translated it inherits the type from the object the first object you are using so uh, you can just transform the data like that and we can see an example I'm not sure if you're familiar I don't give things for um, from granted so I'm just gonna show to you the first date that we set up uh, oh, what did I do oh sorry <laughs> I copied it um, okay so if we print date now it's as you can see is uh, January 1st 1970 blah 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 and uh, this is just a random epoch I found. So if we pass, let's say this is one of those we found uh, before, and we pass it, and we want to print this now. The value is, you know, in a very readable format. You can also change the format to be just a date uh, or a date in a certain uh, like day, month, year. It depends. Uh, I didn't need it, so I just accept all of it. It's fine. Um, okay uh what did we what was the requirement apart from converting that was my first problem uh my main problem converting the date in a nice way and in an easy way but uh, the requirement was to get uh only the people that joined the group in the last seven days and how do you do that um using the same concept basically when you run your script uh, it will run on a certain date and if you um, use get date, you will get the exact date at the moment when the script is running and this is an object uh, and you can apply to it uh, the method add days and if you do yeah minus seven basically you get um, what date it was uh, seven days ago and uh, if that is a uh, this is greater than this then uh, we keep the record otherwise we just keep it and what i do is just to create as i said a new uh, custom object uh, passing the same variables i just get uh, from the other uh, object i add but the joint now as a, a nice format uh, so this is my final member data uh, which is basically the object that helps or um, yeah, the data in the format I'm gonna look for. So I can pass to the, I can go to the next problem. And the next problem was the email. And uh, I looked around a little bit. And uh, one thing I found is that the email had to contain the attachment, right? So I just saved this object in a CSV. So I, then I can just attach it to the, uh, easily to the email. So here I just, you know, find the path, the find a path and then export to CSV. Now, um, here with PowerShell, uh, I think, with, I don't remember if it's PowerShell 6, but for sure 7, uh, you can use, uh, use quotes and then you can say never. And this basically when uh, it creates the um, the CSV, it doesn't put the quotes in every uh, in every field basically, and it gives you uh, a clean list uh, that is easier um, to read. And I use it all the time. I like it very much, um, especially if you need to export data to import them like through an interface somewhere. Uh, it's way easier to or people have to read it uh, it's way easier to it's, it looks better so 
the email. What did I do? Uh, I didn't have a clue how to do this in PowerShell. Then I found out there is this comment, uh, uh, send mail message that accept a lot of other parameters is very nice you can uh, change the priority or the reply to so you can uh, um, manage uh, the the header of the email in a certain way if you need to in this case mine was very very basic so the only thing i had to worry about it was what STM, smtp server i have to use uh, which i wasn't um, really aware um, so you can, uh, if you you don't know like me, you can ask your IT, someone in uh, your IT department. They may tell you uh, uh, what to put in here so to allow the email to to go, you know, to be sent. Then you just put a sender that normally has to be a no reply one because you don't want people you don't want to put your email if it's not necessary. You don't want people to uh, to send you an email or to reply to those things um, so you just put one of those no reply ones uh, the two so to who to send the email to and uh, you can have a list of people uh, or just one um, like in this format in a string concatenated uh, each one of them concatenated with a comma and then a subject and a body, even if the body is not really necessary uh, for this example. But then when you call the, the send mail message, you can set up all those parameters and the attachments. So you basically pass uh, the path that uh, you defined before or uh, if it's somewhere else, I don't know, a file that you saved uh, in another uh, script or whatever. You just pass the path and it will automatically upload it into the email and send it out, which is very nice. Um, I found it super useful uh, to use. And that's it. So this is how sometimes uh, you can use APIs because people ask you things um, and they need data out. Uh, this can be a one-off thing or uh, if you want to parameter. Uh, add parameters so you can put this in a function or uh, in a module uh, that so then uh, every time um, you are asked for the same you can add parameters and pass exactly what you need maybe a different uh, um, addresses or a, a different email subject you can even parameterize if it is just for groups for example you can pass the parameter of uh, the name of the group so when you call the script uh, the function you can pass it and this is all a parameter and it works automatically which is super nice okay next use case uh trello did i mention what trello is i don't remember so trello is uh i'm not sure you're familiar with it uh it's basically a SaaS application uh a software as a service um and uh, it allows you to maintain your uh, Kanban board. So you can organize your work and it's very pretty. The old boards are very easy to use and uh, uh, it's very popular um, as far as I know. So the use case here is uh, when uh, we started using it, uh, I needed to set up the deprovision. Uh, few things. Uh, they were not exposing the um, email in the API, the email of the users uh, in the APIs, not even through the interface. And uh, um, that was weird because uh, you pay for licenses for a company. This is where uh, you think that um, enterprise um, when you have an enterprise license for something, uh, you expect a little uh, level of administration you can do. At this point, um, it was not like that. They didn't even have uh, a scheme endpoint uh, at that uh, scheme API developed at that time. So it was very hard. Uh, what can you do? Um, I I didn't know out then to match my users uh, I had in Trello with people in Active Directory let's say this is uh, that is the way where if someone is uh, um, is deactivated in Active Directory they are leavers 
for example. So you can do that, but you need at least an email to be able to match them. So what did I do? Um, I contact the vendor and the only thing uh, I could do back then it was asking them every time I needed a, a report with a list of users uh, from uh, our uh, installation and uh, they would have sent that in a CSV. So even if I could have run the script on a scheduled basis, which is not nice, but uh, still uh, I wanted to create uh, a script passing the CSV that uh, would have been done, uh, would have done all the job for me. So the only thing I would have done is like email them every now and then uh, to get the list of users. And uh, also this was uh, one of my first approach to PowerShell and um, I'm gonna show you some bad code a little bit. And, uh, sorry my cat. And um, how with time I modified a little bit uh, the code while learning a little bit more of syntax. Um, it's not much, but uh, it shows to you um, how a little bit things can be improved. So, the provision Trello. Okay. Uh, so this was the CSV I was getting from uh, from the support and um, I needed to do two things. So first thing from the CSV I needed to get uh, to compare this list of users with the ones I had in Active Directory to get which one uh, was uh, disabled and then with this list I could go to Trello just you know disabling the ones that needed to be disabled so the first uh, point uh, here I will show you the uh, change of the code as well so the first attempt it was this one um, so I imported the file I was looping into it and uh, I didn't know how to call uh, get ad user and uh, passing the the email in uh, sub expression basically, so I just had, you know assign it to a variable and this looked okay it was working and then I said oh it looks bad that I'm just assigned a variable here I'm just gonna make it pretty every field I'm gonna put in uh, uh, I'm gonna put it here so before and then I will assign them in the to the object and it made you have 10, 15 or 50 of those it's like what? <laughs> this is insanely bad so I learned when I looked at the at the, um, at the code a little bit later uh, well I changed it to be like that and uh, um, yeah, this works out um, in the same way basically but it looks a little bit prettier and uh, there is less code and uh, to describe this object I basically just uh, take uh, the emails and uh, the members as oh yeah I didn't mention the file just said um, the, ID, the IDs from Trello and uh, the emails so I didn't need anything more anyway and I'm just creating the object with the new um, key which uh, uh, is enabled and this is exactly the variable I get uh, from Active Directory nothing much really uh, at that time I was not very um, uh, confident on what I was doing and every time I was creating a new object then I was uh, and manipulating the data I was printing in a CSV because I needed to you know see it uh, in the screen uh, out loud and uh, one thing um, I had to do so at this point uh, we have the full amount of users uh, with all the um, with all the um, the column which can be true or false if it's enabled or not right so I just needed to uh, take the ones with false and what I did at the time it was <laughs> import the file back not because I changed it it's just like I export it I'm gonna import it again and taking the only the ones that have a uh, false uh, in the enable field in the enable column and this looked so weird uh, that 
when I saw it and I realized because then of course you have the object you don't need to import the file again I mean you can export it just for reference if you need to look it up or uh, in some time but why import it again I, I have no clue so yeah I learned that uh, you can do the same uh, where object condition to the object itself and get exactly the same amount of, uh, of data so with this in mind we only have our subset uh, of people uh, to disable so basically uh, what I do here is just uh, what we saw before I take my tokens, um, I looked for the API that uh, I was meant to use uh, and uh, I'm not going to show you example one because it's more very similar to the kind of change I did before so this is what it is, um, it, it was at the end. Uh, Basically, I just take my variable I took from, um, you know, the, the sub-selection of the users and uh, the API is about the members and then it takes uh, the user ID, the one from Trello, so Trello knows that this specific person doesn't recognize people by email, so you need to have um, an ID for this. Um, and also yeah, I'm passing it in this way without um, initializing it in a different variables to the deactivated um, endpoint where the value is true so basically it's true that they are deactivated and they are de deactivating it uh, again I like to create uh, objects out of these things so I create them with the same exact values I don't need to change them but I capture the response and the status code um, from to see if the API uh, run correctly basically and then yeah I just export it again in uh, in another yet in yet another um, CSV but I never look at the CSV so I should just you know remove all these uh, exports <laughs> But this is basically uh, what happens, what are the uh, fl f flows. Um, even if you are expecting something a little bit more elaborated, um, sometimes you just have to cope with it. Yeah, now they have a scheme uh, development uh, of the APIs, um, which works uh, just fine and yeah. Uh, things change with time uh, okay so last use case blue jeans I am not sure I mentioned before what blue jeans is um, basically uh, blue jeans is um, a video conference uh, video conferencing tool and uh, it allows you know online meetings like uh, teams or um, or zoom uh, the use case here is that um, they wanted, um, I have been asked to automatically grant additional permission to a set of users um, when they got the approval for it. Uh, and this permission was about uh, being able to manage events. So if you are the moderator of the call, uh, you have additional things you can do um, to help out when you have these big uh, calls, department kind of calls or updates. Um, this was the, uh, the use case. Um, for the sake of the example, we don't need to know how these users get approved or anything, but once they get approved, I just need to do, um, to grant them with this permission. But uh, the interesting thing is that um, even uh, um, sometimes I think we saw that before also with Trello uh, before to be able to use and to change um, uh, the user profile we need to retrieve the ID from the application itself so the email doesn't work the username that you log in with doesn't work you need to retrieve the unique identifier string or numeric whatever it is uh, that is stored in the application itself and you have no knowledge of so you need to do that before you can do this uh, let's 
see some code. So the first thing, we get the user ID. And the second thing, we grant this permission. So um, if you remember, uh, BlueJeans allows you uh, to create a token and then put it uh, uh, as a query string. There is already the example, so I'm not going to show to you again this. Let's say every time we get um, a new approval, it's by email, and uh, uh, BlueJeans provides us with uh, um, an API, a user API, that where you can search people by email, but only for the sake to get the ID. So we don't get a lot of information out of it apart from the ID. So we run this. Uh, passing the, the user email as a query string as well. Once we call it, uh, the result, if we print it, is like this. So you have only two fields, the count and the, and the user. And the user. So the count is like, yeah, there is one user with this email registered uh, in this domain. And then the users, you need to explode it and then get the ID. This is the numeric ID we are looking for. So what I did, it was just setting up a variable and navigate this object through the user and then the ID. So we just get this basically. In fact, if you print this, uh, yeah, you just get uh, the full variable. So once we have this, what do we do? Uh, we need to call another endpoint to do to be able to do that. In this case, um, is a put method because we need to change actually this flag uh, into the user profile. So this is probably the, the first example of. Um, ah no, that was also the, the provisioning in Trello I didn't mention before, but. Anyway, we call this endpoint, which is basically user, and most of the time you just uh, can concatenate uh, the value um, of the user ID, like the, the endpoint is user and then uh, it follows the ID you just found. Uh, in this case, for this example, to grant you more permission to manage uh, events, uh, this is the actual endpoint we have to call. And this is example is also um, interesting because uh, it's one of those uh, where we actually need to send uh, data through the body. And uh, um, so... When we have to do this, when we have to send data to the body, most of the time, in the other, um, no, most of the time, all, all the time, well, the examples I found all the time, I'm not sure if um, there are cases where you need, you can pass the body without uh, using an adder with the content type, but you need to tell what type of um, uh, information you are uh, sending and how they should accept it. Sometimes they can be different. Um, and the body then, uh, this is all of course the, uh, defined by, um, by the vendor. So you can find all those things uh, in the documentation. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, we are calling exactly the same thing. So any to many, um, it's called like that, I'm not sure why. Uh, but then we have to tell the name of the feature uh, we are talking about and what choice for that feature is. In this case, it's true. So you can, I guess you can use, an, uh, you can use the same for um, um, removing the permission if you set this to false, right? Um, so this is it. Uh, you just define uh, your body uh, in this way uh, with the right format and uh, you just call it. And what happens uh, is that uh, if you print res, this is what you get. Uh, this is an ID, but I'm not sure it can be an ID of, uh, you know, how many times um, this has been called, uh, a generic ID. The name of uh, the permission you have uh, set up, uh, what choice did you make? So it, it's kind of a recap of whatever happened to what user to, you have applied to it. I'm not sure, maybe there are two, 
there can be different so in uh, depending on what case you can have different information but uh, uh, this is it uh, and it's pretty um, pretty interesting to see how all those things uh, um, work together okay Here it is, uh, we are done. This is just the recap of what we learned. So what are the takeaways? Uh, the first one is uh, APIs are an amazing tool. Uh, it can make your job way easier, uh, but you need to understand how they work. Um, yes, the, they use standards, but each company develops them in a different way. Uh, sometimes endpoints don't act the way uh, we think they do. Um, there can be a lot of problems, but uh, you just need to learn and understand how they work. So you need to just get used to reading their documentation or engage with vendors uh, uh, if you have problems and uh, be careful because before you um, update uh, or disable all your uh, employees. Uh, start small and then uh, when you are more confident, you just uh, um, you know go ahead with, uh, with whatever you have to do. And the second thing is uh, PowerShell provides you with commands that help you immensely. Uh, you notice that Apart from managing the data and um, putting it in the in the correct format, uh, it's super easy to, um, to 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 call those APIs uh, using uh, the uh, invoke uh, REST method, for example. I didn't show to you every parameter, uh, but go read the documentation if you need anything um, different or more than this you may find more information it's very wide and it accommodates a lot a lot of use cases way more uh, complicated than uh, those small ones uh, i've been talking to you about um and what else you yes this is super good but you still need to pay attention uh, to the format of the way you send data as i said so um just read uh, all the documentation and uh, uh, also uh, see how the data are treated in uh, powershell are very important to make you fast and not um trying hard um you know making things work um you can do it <laughs> um the third thing the third and last thing is keep your token safe um, I cannot stress this topic enough. Um, as you saw, uh, there can be a lot of ways you can authenticate and uh, uh, you can be like, oh, I'm just going to try this out and then you forget about that file where you have the uh, an administration token uh, that can do anything in one of your platforms. So uh, please be careful. <laughs> it's um, It's very important. So this is done. Um, thank you so much for have listened up until this point. Uh, the slides and uh, code will be available here soon. Probably it's already available. Depends when you are listening. And uh, thank you so much uh, for listening. I hope you had fun and uh, you will find uh, this thing useful. And uh, don't forget next year. Uh, uh, PowerShell, uh, the PowerShell Conference Europe uh, 21 will happen in those days. So uh, I hope to see you there or uh, I hope to see you um, the 2nd and the 3rd of June, um, now 2024, the virtual version of the, the PowerShell um, Conference. Thank you so much.